My guest today is the extremely talented and hardworking Victoria Vujic. She might be young-ish, but already has a lot of achievements under her belt. From being a streamer, hosting eSport events, and working in an eSport organization, she became a co-founder of a technological startup. In this episode, Victoria shares insights from running a startup, from the hardships of attracting potential investors, to Gen Z and their thoughts on advertising, and touches on how brands can rediscover their approach to reach new generations. I'm Katarzyna Dombrowska, and it's simple, you know? My guest today is Vicky Vujic, one of the co-founders of Instreamly. Hi, Vicky. Thanks for joining me today. Hello. Hi. So, Vicky, what does it actually mean to be a co-founder of Instreamly? So, what do I do every day? Yeah, what do you do every day? Yeah, I think the main point of being a founder of a company is you do everything that needs to be done and there's nobody else to do it right now. So, uh, I think of myself as a person that connects dots and whether it's like designing some new product feature or maybe uh, like strategizing our communication or just like having an idea on how to do it. This is my job. Like most of the time I switch from uh, parts of the company. This is also because I want to, uh, because I really want to learn all the things uh, that make companies work. Mm -hmm. So one day I'll be pitching to VCs and fundraising and the other day I will be preparing some product descriptions and that's how it rolls. Tell me, what is the story of Instreamly? How did it actually get started? How did you get involved in the whole process? So Instreamly as an idea started in 2018. Uh, It was first made by Maciej and Damian. They knew each other for quite some time because they met in 2010. And uh, I was working with Maciej back then. I remember. That's when I met you. Yeah, it was my first job. I I remember walking in. Sorry to interrupt you, but I remember walking in and uh, uh, I remember thinking, she's got really good English. Why does she have good English? And I asked Maciej later and I was like, why does she have such good English? He's like, I don't know. That's my story about you. Yeah, so I was 20, I think, or or barely 20, (laughs) let's say. And I was working with Maciej. Uh, We met like a year before uh, when he was organizing a conference in sport and gaming forum with Shimon, Mm -hmm. uh, other co-founder of Instreamly. And I was there because there were some tickets for the young, uh, ambitious, but poor. So I, <laughs> I fell into this category and just got there because I thought this is my interest to the esport world. I want to work in it. This is, this is my future career. Mm-hmm. And I was a uh, like, first year student at the time. So I just met a lot of people and this really like, opened my eyes on what can esports be, even in Poland. Mm-hmm. And since then, I've been in touch with Maciej. We did some project, like Project Esport is a community of uh, Polish esport professionals or wannabes. And uh, then I started working with him at the production house. And Instreamly was like a back project, like once once we like developed uh, as a side thing. We had our first deck, it was 60 slides. So mm-hmm. right now, Instreamly deck is 10 slides. Back then it was 60 slides and they did not like deliver how Instreamly works Mm -hmm. properly. Like you couldn't make somebody understand. Yeah. From those 60 slides, you couldn't understand what it actually does. Yeah. And now in 10 slides or even in three minutes, we can explain it. So you learn along the way how to do it. And uh, then we started working at Devils One. Uh, Shimon joined Devils One. It's an esports organization and Maciej found it. I worked with streamers and uh, and players there, and we needed a tool to just manage our own sponsorship campaigns we had as, as an esports organization. So we like dusted off this old Instreamly project and tried it out, then make some more tweaks. And it came out that like for example, brands want to join in, want to use it to work with streamers. And in November 2019, so uh, nearly a year ago, we decided, okay, this is big. We are going full time. Okay. See, I didn't even know about that part that it kind of, you know, was put in a in a drawer or on a shelf for some time. And then you took it out because you actually needed it for Devil's One. Yeah, it, it was like, it was always in the back of our minds. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, we always fought about it, but even the product b- back there, it was really hard to use it. Mm-hmm. Like the major changes came in, in November later. Uh, but yeah, we were so focused on working and making e- an esports organization happen that you don't have time to, to think about everything else. But happily, we did manage to at least uh, have some part of that time uh, to make Instreamly happen. Yeah. So you you said that you can do a pitch in three minutes. I know you've done a million pitches. Uh, Tell me what it does. So there is a revolution of distribution of content and live content. Now it's not the TV leading, but millions of independent broadcasters. They are called streamers and they stream from their homes. And most of those streamers uh, have limited options to work with brands, like to gain money from advertising on their streams. Why? Because brand sponsorships are really hard to do. You have to go to each streamer and say, hey, streamer, here is a banner. Please put it on your stream for a week, but please don't show it on CSGO because we don't like blood and guns. And uh, after we will pay you an X amount for X views, etc. It's a lot of work. And if mm-hmm. you do it with 100 streamers, impossible. So you instead do it with just one who has uh, the biggest reach. Yeah, like, like with influencers, you want the influencer that has like a million followers, not 100. Yeah, but it's better if you have uh, 100 influencers that have 100 viewers instead of one that has uh, like 10,000 viewers. Yeah. So... Uh, we thought that there is like opportunities for 0.01% of streamers. So those, the biggest ones. And there's like 99% of streamers who are underserved and don't get these opportunities at all. So you're a little bit like Robin Hood. Yeah, maybe <laughs> not Robin Hood because we are not taking from the rich. No. I think it is still viable for brands to work with the biggest streamers. I always forget that Robin Hood took from the yeah, rich. <laughs> yeah. I think we like maybe uh, opened the word. Mm-hmm. A little bit of an equalizer, maybe. Yeah, equalizer, democratizing it. Mm-hmm. So it's available to more brands and it will make the whole uh, market grow and it will benefit the biggest streamers in the end. And uh, so what we did is a marketplace where brands can connect with stream- streamers directly. So the outreach thing is, is easier. And also we automated the execution. So you don't have to say to each streamer, please move this banner or please show this banner on CSGO, but this banner on League of Legends, we do it automatically through our tool. And like this made possible uh, cooperations like one brand with 285 streamers at the same time. And it's working. Yeah. Uh, I want to I wanna talk to you about the process of funding uh, because I think that's really interesting uh, when you have a startup and, you know, you need money. Like that's literally what you need. Uh, I've never been through a process like that myself. I've been a little bit in the background of, of some processes, so I know very little. How does one get money for a startup? The biggest question you have to ask yourself is if you need the money from an investor because you can make a re- reliable income and like a good company with your own money, like bootstrapping, it's called bootstrapping, mm-hmm. and from the income you gain from the clients by not selling your equity uh, to an investor. But we were with the same decision. A year ago, after a month of operating, we were able to just like sustain the company from the income we got from the Polish market. Because we were like five people working in the company uh, and it worked. Not many overheads, not too much uh, things to pay. Yeah, no, not too much room to grow too. Because mm-hmm. if we wanted to grow, we would have to hire more people, invest some money in marketing, etc. and development. Yeah. Classic. So we either could have like been a small company in Poland or decide to go global scale, make the biggest product and really like conquer the market. Mm-hmm. And for that, we needed the money. So this is uh, why we went for investment. And basically investment is you search for people who believe in your company the same way as you do, or even more than you do. Mm -hmm. And they want to be a part of it. They cannot put in time to work in the company, but they want to put their money uh, for an equity stake, of course, and benefit from future profits. So... It's not that hard. I think there's like 5,000 VC firms in the world. So there's a lot of people uh, even fighting for the best deals for the best startups. But for most people, it's just a lot of legwork. 
like you underestimate when you are a founder or you are thinking about building a startup. The one thing you underestimate is how long the funding process takes. Mm -hmm. Even if you are a hot startup, like we, I can say are a hot startup, <laughs> we have a big growth. And even our like funding round this year, it took four months of my nearly full time uh, like approach to it. And okay. it, we had like 40 funds in talks with us. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we ended up with four that we decided that fit us and they decided that they also like feel that we are great. Yeah. So so it's like a full time job at, at one point getting funding. Yeah, it's a full time job of you going around and telling people why you are awesome and then asking questions that uh, doubt that you are awesome and you have to prove that you yeah, are awesome. Co convince them that you are awesome. So uh, along the way, you have like a couple of things to prepare. It's a pitch deck. There is a lot of resources about how to make a pitch deck. Mm -hmm. uh, my thing is make it short, make it easy to understand yeah. and be able to talk about it adding some more and yeah. with passion. Yeah, you don't want the 60 slides, you want the 10 slides. It's like respect their time. You know, no one wants a, you know, too long didn't read. Yeah, respect them, their time and also uh, be able and be open to, to change the deck. So mm -hmm. our deck, like even in this three months, it was like three or four versions of the deck. Okay. So you get a lot of questions, you see what they put emphasis on mm -hmm. and you should answer this in the deck. And the next thing you will prepare, they will be asking you a lot of questions on the mail. So just like get the questions, prepare the answers and save them somewhere because other so you don't fans have to write them. Will, yeah, will be asking <laughs> the same things over and over again. And also you reading those things over and over again makes you really think about the company because some questions are what is your uh, marketing strategy? What is your uh, product strategy? And you think you have to just come out with those things and with th some of those things, you don't even like see that you will need them mm -hmm. in a month or so. And they just ask for it. Yeah. How did you make a decision who is going to be in charge of the funding process with the VCs? As in there's four founders. How do you decide, oh, it's going to be me and this person and not this person? Like what, how did you choose? So the choice is simple. Dam Damien is uh, working as a CTO. He has a whole product to develop. Yeah. Like, let's not take his time. We need <laughs> his double his time of his work right now. Uh, it's the same case with Shimon. He's focused on, on sales and growth. So there is me and Mati left and we split the, the founding process. So I took some of the initial calls. Also, Mati took some of the initial calls. And then on the second and third calls, uh, we were both of them and I was the one preparing all the documentation and the answers to questions. So you have to have the CEO on the like subsequent call, calls mm -hmm. with a VC. They want to know the CEO. But they were also okay with, with me pitching the, the first one. Also because I, I think I did it a lot. So I know just how to do it and it's, mm -hmm. it's all right for me. What did you think was the most unexpected thing that you learned from this process of getting funding? Maybe it wasn't that unexpected. One thing would be that esport, gaming, live streaming, hot word, buzzwords, everything is gaming for gamers. Everyone to, wants to be in gaming esports and it's also with VCs. But right now it's more of them like, being interested in the space and maybe investing in some gay co game companies. But most fans, even the ones who understand games, do, do not understand live streaming or like there is like a lot of explaining to do. You need to be able to explain the simplest of things. And this is what surprised me the most because I was prepared that people will just know the things because it's so popular right now. Mm -hmm. And you have to prepare to be able to explain everything. And the second thing was, uh, as I said, how long it took. Okay. Um, with the VCs, you know, they're used to investing in lots of different things. And like you mentioned, they might know a little bit about gaming, uh, but they might not really know that much about streaming. Um how do they make the decision to actually go into a streaming business when they don't really know that much about it? 
I think they just do research. I was really, really surprised like how thorough uh, was the super note uh, due diligence, so our investor due diligence. They did a big, good research on the market and they understood it, even to the point that once they shared some data with us, it influenced and changed our decks because we understood how they, uh, how they have seen the market, how they made the decision. And it was kind of eye-opening for us because they looked at it from another approach. So it's like with understanding anything, you have to just put in the legwork and do your research and prepare some writing about it. You mentioned that they looked at it from a different perspective, like they had a different approach. What was that approach? What was it about it that surprised you? I think like we really focused on the streamer and esports sponsorship side of things, not so on influencer marketing. So what they did was they really uh, looked into how brands are interested in influencer marketing and advertising in the space like of live streaming or gaming as a whole and shown it from the approach that brands already like are banging on the doors to invest money in here and put in the advertising money, but they don't have any options. So it wasn't like a very big change of what we said, but it was another approach to it. And it really like made our story very cohesive. Okay. So I was having a conversation the other day about how people perceive advertising. I'm a millennial and like I'm a little bit like, fuck the advertising, take it away. Like, even though I know that it helps, you know, people make money that way. And, you know, I like making money too, but I have this thing with advertising, you know, I really don't like it. Um, do you think that people who watch streams have a slightly different attitude to this? They're a little bit younger. They have a little bit of a different approach. I think they don't have a different approach to advertising as a whole because everyone hates advertising, uh, the unsensitive advertising, because we enjoy the Super Bowl ads or like the masterpieces of, of marketing and advertising. Mm -hmm. They're just fun to watch. But what they do is they bring you value, the fun, the fault or something else. And they just don't only sell to you. So it's the same with, uh, with Gen Z. And I even think that we have the same uh, bullshit detector or even more of a bullshit detector than millennials. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, we are so used to ads, we don't see them. They are just there. There have always been ads. We have always been on the internet. So we use ad blocks. And on the other hand, we expect a lot from them. So I think it's a shift of what is important in advertising, mm -hmm. uh, what is important uh, in what brands say, because I think this generation is very conscious about uh, what advertising means. What I mean by that is when I was a teacher at the eSports Skills Camp, it's an like summer camp for mm -hmm. kids who want to be eSports players. And I had uh, this uh, lecture about social media, uh, making your uh, public image, etc. And I asked those like 11 year old boys, uh, how much money does a YouTuber make from advertising? And they knew all the rates. They knew how much for this, wow. for that, uh, how much money a YouTuber mer makes from merch, etc. They are really curious about those things and this is natural to them. So uh, advertising like needs to step up this game of being bringing value and making something interesting because this generation like just doesn't see the bullshit advertising. Either blocks it or just like box it in, this, in their minds. That really surprised me that 11 year olds know how much YouTubers are making and they can spit off all the stats. Like, I mean, I don't know these things. Okay, also I'm not so maybe interested as they are, uh, but that that's really interesting uh, to me. Mm, what do you think makes a campaign, maybe not even a campaign, but what kind of brands do you think are more successful with streamers? You know, if you're advertising on a stream, you're doing a campaign, what is it about the campaign or what is it about the brand that you think will resonate with the audience? Uh, I think the brands who think about advertising not as a lead generation thing, but as a way to build relationships with the customers. 
So in some way, when you meet somebody and you want to build a relationship with them, what do you do? You say all the amazing things about yourself or you are open to listening what they want and just being open to their word. And it's the same with streaming advertising. So the brands who are open to give this bit of creativity and control of the messaging to streamers or people who know streamers will be the ones that benefit from it because they are entering the world of streamers and you cannot fake yourself in here. Mm -hmm. You cannot come in here and say, hello, I'm a gamer brand. <laughs> it's impossible. But if you say, hello, I'm a brand and I really respect gamers, I want to be here. Can you show me this word? Mm -hmm. And if you come with the respect, you, you are met with a respect, mm -hmm. uh, like in, in response. So I think all the brands that like, uh, for example, are fair to the creators and uh, make artwork that really put gamers and how the community of streaming world uh, works in mind will win in the long run. Okay. I want to take it back a little bit because at the beginning you said that uh, you want to work in esports. Like you were like, yes, this is what I want to do. Why? Because I played a lot of games. <laughs> So you thought that this would be a good way to just play games for the rest of your life. And now things have changed. <laughs> now you see the reality of it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about playing games as, as a work because I knew that I will not be a pro player. Mm -hmm. And like having worked in an esports organization and seeing uh, how much work it requires to be an esports player. No, I don't want it. It's <laughs> like a, a 12 hour like a day work week that is like six days a week for a year or so under extreme stress. So no, uh, but I just like played a lot of games. I spent like a thousand hours watching League of Legends and uh, another thousand watching League of Legends esports. And I just thought that I want to work in marketing. This, this was my thing. I want to be a marketer, work in marketing, something along this. And I thought... I like esports, I like games. I have some ideas how to make it better, how to make the best campaigns in here. Yay, 18-year-old me, you had the best <laughs> ideas, I know, uh, for everything in the world. And I just uh, thought that this is a way to go. And also, maybe this was an afterthought, but in sports, if you want to talk with the coach of the best team in the country, you cannot just go down the stadium and just like meet him and, and talk to him and say, hey, I have some ideas about how you should play. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. It's in a closed environment. In esports, you can be an expert after a year of being active in the community. You can like get to the, to the coach and talk with them. Everything is open. So it was a way for me to really become an expert, really uh, mean something in an industry because this industry is so new. So mm -hmm. being new to it is nothing wrong. So it was like really natural for you to want to work in this. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I'm always curious about this part of uh, eSport and gaming because this is not the kind of gaming that I do, but watching other people play games. And I think this is the thing when I speak to people about what it is that I do and, and, and what I'm involved in, the, the thing that I hear the most from people, even people who are complete gamers who love gaming is, but what about the watching of the people playing? What is all that about? That's the most common thing I hear. So tell me from your perspective, what is it about watching other people play games? I don't know, ask the football fans. <laughs> uh, no, but I think it's, it depends on the person. Some people watch games to be better at playing the game. Some people just treat it like as a pastime. Like you, if you never watched a video on YouTube of dog grooming, carpet cleaning or anything like really weird just to pass your time, I don't believe you. <laughs> You know, literally, I think that's me, though. I don't think I really do that. <laughs> Maybe you won't believe me, but I think For I don't. For sure. Once in your life, you do. <laughs> Everyone did it. Uh, I love the carpet cleaning videos. And it's just a, like a pastime. You, you watch something you're familiar with. Uh, you can talk with other people, like be a part of community because the whole chat and the streamer is interacting with you. And something of it is just like, 
it's fun. I like to watch it. I liked watching uh, the best players play the play the champion. I don't know how to play, and I just I like this champion. And it wasn't for me to learn, but because I wasn't skilled enough to to learn from it. But it was just fun. The emotions of an esports tournament is something else. Mm -hmm. But I think in this age we shouldn't be very surprised that people watch other people playing games. We watch other people do a lot of things. We watch other people watch other things. Too, like mm. the whole reaction videos mm -hmm. on YouTube. This is huge. Yeah. And I think this is even weirder than watching live streaming. That is streaming. weird. And I've done that. Not not much, not much, but I've done that. You With, see, yeah, I, I I've, told you I've you've done, done that. Okay, I've watched some weird shit, that's true. Yeah, so it's the same here. It's like just what humans have fun of. Like people have watched other people play chess. Mm -hmm. People have watched other people do many, many other things. Yeah. Why Why should we be surprised? Yeah, at this? this this is the thing that kind of surprises me because like I don't watch other people play games, but I understand it. But I am a little bit surprised at the misunderstanding around it because, yeah, we watch football games. We, we watch all kinds of stuff. We watch all kinds of people do all kinds of stuff. So it's interesting that there's this resistance to, to people watching people play games. I'm not sure where it comes from. Yeah, and you also get the argument, yeah, but when you are watching people play football, you're watching the best people play football. And I call bullshit on this one. Mm -hmm. So when you have your favorite team and this is a team of like a local team of football team, they don't have to be the best, but you are still cheering on them. You're still watching their matches, even even this is this isn't the highest level of the mm -hmm. competition. And it's the same in gaming. You're watching the people you like, mm -hmm. even if they are not the best. Because it's it's not necessarily just about uh, watching them play. Because I was I had this uh, thought the other day when you told me that you would watch me play cyberpunk and I was like maybe I should stream myself playing cyberpunk <laughs> you know maybe I should do this and I started thinking about it that because uh, I was playing and I was talking uh, during this and I realized like maybe somebody would actually find my comments funny because I talk at the tv while I'm playing the game you know and I thought like okay maybe this is also a part of why people watch it because yeah, there's because someone commenting funny. all the yeah. things and you know I felt a little bit like a stand-up comedian no one, no one was listening to me, but, but me. But maybe there's an element of that. Yeah, there is. There is. Like you, you feel like you're on the stage. I was streaming too. Not a lot of viewers though. But I always felt like there are people who are listening to you. And being listened is is great. And also they just want to see what you think. We listen to podcasts. We mm -hmm. listen to people say their thoughts about many things. So why don't listen? their thoughts uh, about the game in mm -hmm. real time. Yeah. This is just it. I kind of regret now that I wasn't recording myself because I have a lot of gold thoughts on Cyberpunk on PS4. <laughs> like I have a lot of opinions. That's why I said you should stream. <laughs> yeah, I probably should. Uh, you mentioned just now that you were streaming. Can you tell me a little bit about that? How did it start? What were you streaming? A little bit about this adventure. Okay, so 2016, I moved into Warsaw for studies I started like my first year and I thought okay I have still a month before the uh, year starts I want to go as an intern to a marketing agency and I sent like 20 CVs and after sending them I noticed that I like had a huge mistake in it and I just thought okay fuck it I'm just gonna be a game streamer and get paid for people watching me play games I'm Wait, not hang gonna on. make it as a marketer. there was a mistake in your CV yeah and I thought like ah it's not gonna work what was the mistake in your CV it wasn't even a big mistake I just made like a whole CV with a portfolio etc all the things because I was photographing a lot at the time mm -hmm. and I spent five hours on it uh, because I started by fixing one small mistake and then like five hours passed and I did not fix the first mistake I was supposed to. So it was just like really re irritating. <laughs> so you said, fuck it, I'm going to be a streamer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fuck it, it's going to be easier. I, I just cannot even send my CV properly. I'm just going to be a streamer. <laughs> okay. And this was the last CV I sent in my, uh, in my life. So that's good. That's good. How old yeah. were you? Uh, 18. I hope that everybody sends their last CV when they're 18. I wish that to the whole world. That would be <laughs> yeah. amazing. 
that would be amazing. <laughs> so, uh, and I just started streaming. I met some great people. Uh, like what I games was were you streaming? League of Legends. Okay. But I was streaming on an old laptop, 30 FPS on the stream. Mm -mm. Uh, like not on the stream, in the game or even less when there was some action. So you just like couldn't hear me. Uh, the <laughs> camera was off. Like the camera was blurry, etc. But I had fun and people watched me and they talked to me and I just met some people that were my friends. I was also in some, let's say, kind of a dark moment in my, in my life mm -hmm. uh, and I felt lonely. So this was like the moments when I interacted with people in, in a safe way, let's mm -hmm. say. So it was fun and it also like made me open about making your own community or talking to people more openly. Like I was so scared of making my fan page because I was so scared of what people will think mm -hmm. or other people will be, uh, will, or if uh, like my friends from high school will think this is cringy that I am playing games and streaming. Mm -hmm. So I was really afraid. And in the end, it came out that the person who was the the harshest about this was, was me. Mm, Everyone yeah. was like, wow, cool, you're streaming. Oh, wow, you have interesting things to say. Yeah. And yeah, this is like my thing of encouragement. So every time I think that I shouldn't publish this or write about something or talk about something because some people will not like it. Uh, it it's like the, the thing you should care the most about is about those few people who will like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's always our own voice of judgment. I think that's the loudest. And we think that it's coming from other people, but actually it's just coming from us. Yeah, it's it's just coming for us. So I always even laugh that I don't need uh, negative feedback because I know all the negatives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have the same thing. I, I understand that. Uh, you know, I... Uh, as you know, and as I know, and as I'm sure anyone who listens to this knows, you are my first female guest, which I'm super excited about. And uh, so I want to ask you a little bit about what, it, well, first of all, what it was like being a, a girl streamer. Is it any different being a girl streamer than a boy streamer? Is it, uh, is there some kind of a different kind of treatment? How, how does it work? I think boy streamers here show boobs less <laughs> uh, but on the other hand I think you are responsible for your community for the community you raise so my stream it was a small stream probably also because of of that uh, but people on my stream could watch me like uh, peel potatoes and talk about philosophy and we are talking meaning of life uh, religion all the things and the chat was like great people were great there and of course from time to time there was a person who just came in said some not nice words and criticized me uh, my uh, how i look etc but it wasn't like that hard i think for me girl streamers for sure have an easy time to hit from zero viewers to just like 10 20 40 people it's uh, is the hardest part for the male streamers but mm -hmm. when you look at the biggest numbers and the biggest streamers in the world there's not a lot, a lot of female streamers and I cannot say why I'm just like one day there will be I hope so uh, I think the world expects different things from female streamers they are put up on on higher uh, like a pedestal no, not that pedestal. Uh, you expect more uh, you from have, them. Okay, higher so expectations. So if she dances, just dance. You expect she, uh, on one hand, that she looks good, but on the other hand, you will criticize her if she wears leggings. Mm -hmm. And it's always like a br blurry line. But on the other hand, I didn't feel it myself mm -hmm. because I was also lucky to have a small stream. But if I were a bigger streamer, I know some struggles of, of streamers, even in Poland, uh, that have 400, 500 viewers and people stalking them. Wow. It also happens to male streamers. Okay. It's, it's not just like exclusive to female streamers, but I think you feel more threatened uh, about like an uh, rape on a street than, than like a male streamer. But mm -hmm. it's, it's to all entertainers in the world. Okay, so there's, it's really interesting to me because this is like what I call a community famous. When you're like, you can walk down the street and no one will recognize you, but if you go to an industry event 
everybody will know who you are. And, you know, having 500 v viewers doesn't really actually seem like, like a huge amount or anything. It's also not a small amount, but it's interesting to me that people are following people around. Like you can have 20 viewers and, and have a hit a stalker. stalker. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's but, just unlucky. But I think the point with streaming is that it started us or had it like the most of development with the best players playing games, only games. And now the just chatting category is the biggest and the tides are changing. It's about how good of an entertainer you are. So I think like along the, the next years, while the streaming grows, uh, we will see more and more popular girls in mm -hmm. streaming. But yeah. it also like requires a lot, a lot of dedication and attention. Yeah. I think like with anything that you want to be successful at. What about being a woman in business, especially in, in the tech business? I also was lucky here. I am lucky <laughs> to, uh, to work with great people and uh, just or maybe also not to see some things. Because my parents always like treated me, they say like, as an adult, they always mm -hmm. answered all my questions, always like I never heard from them that this is not suitable for a girl. You want to skateboard, go skateboard. You want mm -hmm. to uh, ride on horses, ride on horses. You want to draw, draw. You want to play computer games? Okay. And I had the same thing. I had the same thing. And I think it, it changes how you look because uh, I don't have this huge... Um, being a woman in tech, I don't have this huge feeling of like, I'm a woman in tech, not yeah. so much. So I don't know if you have a similar thing. And I always heard from my mother that I will be an entrepreneur when I'm older. Like she doesn't see any other way for me. <laughs> uh, so I had this, uh, I am lucky to just be confident in it. But I also know that there are more people who had their dreams and like aspirations crushed mm -hmm. uh, for a long time. And this also made like it normal for other people to believe that they their dreams do not belong to them. So you cannot be a woman and dream about being an entrepreneur or a CEO or anything. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's very conscious. Nobody like I don't think there is a lot of people in the world that like consciously think, oh, women are worse. Women mm -hmm. don't belong in tech. No, but there is a lot of people who will unconsciously think that this might be not good because a woman wrote it, just because seeing the face. And this is the biggest problem with anything diversity. It's we talk about some problems and people, because they are not consciously like bad or racist or mm -hmm. misogynistic or mm -hmm. anything, think that this is not a problem, this does not exist because it does not concern them consciously. Mm -hmm. But when you go deep into unconscious things, it changes a lot. For me, the biggest thing maybe in esports happened when I was hosting an event and on scene. And after the event, some industry professional, mm -hmm. old man, uh, told me that uh, he wouldn't let a woman without uh, high heels on the scene mm -hmm. and I should wear high heels. And I was so pissed about that. Like, yeah. Why is the first point of your feedback for me to wear heels? How does it make me a better host? Yeah. And everyone around me, like when I was talking about this in some events or, or other things was like, what's so bad about wearing heels? I, I said, it's not about wearing heels. I wore heels the next day because I had like this outfit planned the next mm -hmm. day. It's about somebody having the feedback and the think about what makes me a good host is me wearing heels. Yeah. I don't care about heels. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, well, well, first of all, heels are uncomfortable. Yeah. That's like the first thing the I would like, thing. I would like him to wear heels and then we can have a conversation and he wears heels on stage. That's when he can talk about it. Uh, but yeah, I know what you mean. It's like the focus on women a lot of the time tends to be about their appearance rather than actually the, the content or the merit of what they were saying. Yeah, and you sometimes say that uh, this woman is, uh, the man is engaged and the woman is too emotional. Right. So all those things, there are small, small things, but they sum up to just like some big things that hit on you. And sometimes I have this hint of, they, they don't listen to me because I'm a woman? Or mm -hmm. is this just like the way it is? Or... Uh, 
my idea was bad. It it doesn't it doesn't happen in the company because we like have a great culture and all the all people respect each other. I yeah I think so yeah. But well, like I love making fun of your age, but that's because you know I really respect what you do, and I feel a little bit not good enough because when I think about what I was doing when I was your age. I was not doing that. <laughs> so I take any chance I can to just make fun of your age. You yeah, know? but making fun of such things also when you are confident in and with a mutual respect with each other is like, this, I call it love language. <laughs> yes, yes, we have we have touched on your lang- love language today <laughs> yeah. already. Um, so we know that sometimes there's challenges being a woman in, in tech. Do you think that there are sometimes situations where being a woman is favorable Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, once a person asked me if I'm going to take advantage of being a woman in esports, but it's the same in tech mm-hmm. because like I'm a unique, uh, if there is like five hosts to take and one, only one of them is a woman and you have to take two, you will take the woman. Yeah. So this was my advantage. Mm-hmm. I like was good to look at, etc. Mm-hmm. And I said to him that this will like being a woman will be an obstacle for me so my I might as well take advantage of it when I can Mm -hmm. so in the same way for sure there's like this hype of uh, diversity in tech talking about women they are more highlighted right now and for sure this makes me more unique Mm -hmm. so for me it's a good thing but in the end uh, yeah I think this just makes me unique but on the other hand, I don't want to be unique because I'm a woman. Mm-hmm. I don't want being a young uh, woman with dreams or just pursuing a career with ambition, etc., being a unique thing. Mm-hmm. I want this to be to be seen as normal. So yeah. this is uh, something one day I want to uh, inspire some girls to do. Yeah. So I want to be the same person like my parents were to me that said, like, you can do anything you want. Mm-hmm. And I want to be like some in some way this person to to other girls or maybe guys, too. Yeah. Yeah. That you can just, you know, follow your dreams and you can do whatever you want to do. Yeah. As long as you work hard for it, because yeah. it's, it's all about not just you can be whatever you want and you should expect it from the world. No. If you work hard for it, you should be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to take it back for a second to streamers because I wanted to ask your opinion about something, but I forgot during the conversation. Uh, and it's about, um, like, I don't know if it was a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, or, you know, I, my concept of time is a little bit blurry, but, uh, some streamers, like really top streamers decided to put a cap on how much uh, donations they can get from, uh, from their fans. What do you think about this? I think it's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing is fans that uh, that are very young people who just take parents' credit card and <laughs> pay a lot. This sometimes happens, but it also happens with games or anything. Uh, I remember once even my friend bought us tickets to London when we were 15. We didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> so, like plane tickets? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this happens. Uh also, yesterday I saw uh, Koch Kernich, uh, it's one of the biggest streamers, also uh, one of the best prepared and admirable ones, I think. Uh, he said that he's taking off his donation tip button mm-hmm. of the, his stream page. So I'm like completely taking it off, not accepting any. He's taking this off mm-hmm. and putting in tip the moderation tip. So he has all those people who work on the stream, who moderate uh, the stream, the chat, uh, okay. change things. This is like a lot of work with the stream mm-hmm. and moderators are like really crucial. Yeah. So he instead, he said that he doesn't need those money. He wants to give it to, to the moderation team. Yeah. So I think like mm, donation is like Patreon and people like uh, supporting the creators. Uh, I wish there was a way, like I know there is a way because it extremely does it, <laughs> but for uh, for the viewers to support the creator in in some way that is free for them. So mm-hmm. it just like just doesn't put them on a strain, financial strain, mm-hmm. uh, but also for a streamer to make it more easy to ask the viewers of something. Because yeah. I always felt like weird, weirded out by asking people, hey, donate me money. Mm-hmm. Not a good thing, but oh, sometimes people do it. 
And uh, yeah, so that's why we all, what we also wanted to change. So to, to give this, the streamers and the viewers power so to, for example, click on, on the link of, uh, of some kind of sponsor or choose the e-commerce store or choose the brand mm -hmm. that streamer is partnered with. So streamer gets a kickback from it. You just you have to buy a TV or a phone uh, all the time. Yeah. So just choose the brand that supports your streamer. Mm -hmm. And this is what we want to do and we are doing now and probably will further do so to make this strain of income less uh, less of a burden for, for the viewers. Yeah, okay. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up in a minute. So I've got like my two favorite questions. All right. So the first question is, uh, what advice would you give to uh, anyone who wants a career in esports or who wants to do a startup? What What's your like number one tip for, for someone like that? Find good people to do it with. Mm. So you cannot do it all your, yourself. And if you believe in it, you will be surprised mm -hmm. because in the end even if you make it like start and it's like a rocket ship you you need a crew for it because you cannot manage all those tiny things you need people for it so find people you can trust find people you are happy to build things with and have ha find people who are a bit different than you okay because if you're all the same you think the same way no new ideas no new approach and if you are a bit different each one of you and sometimes you disagree uh it just makes it work great. Yeah. And yeah, I think this is the, the best thing to do. I had a little joke now about you arguing with Shimon. Yeah, but, yeah. But I also thought I about you about with Shimon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we argue a lot. I think also our relationship working together changed in, in this mm -hmm. year. I think it's it's getting better now. Like we argue with each other. And but you can see that there's like a love and respect there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I all yeah, I value like arguing with Shimon a lot and I think we go given ourselves more room to argue with each other mm -hmm. and more room to say, Okay, it's it's pointless to argue right now, do what you wish. Mm -hmm. So yeah. just to trust each other. And this is great because yeah. we still argue with each other and yeah. this makes us do better things. Yeah, but there's a trust. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, okay, I don't agree with you, but if you really think you want to do it that way, okay, fine, let's let's do it that way. Uh, okay, and finally, what advice would you give? I have a joke here, I know, but what advice do you have to your younger self? <laughs> give the joke. <laughs> no, it's just, it's just like, what younger self? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what younger self? <laughs> There were a lot of my younger self. So I would give the 17-year-old uh, depressed self uh, a word that it will be all right. Just mm -hmm. do your thing. Mm -hmm. And like for the, the curious younger self that believed that she can do everything, because I always did that, is still believe it. Mm -hmm. uh, still be curious. Be curious about all the things that are on the things and be humble like mm. you like this this uh, feeling of i know everything the best i can do everything the best it's it's great because i don't think if i can if there is a thing to do a task i don't think oh i don't know if i can do it mm -hmm. i just say to myself oh hey okay i have to do it mm -hmm. and i know how to do it i even if i don't know how to do it i'm I'll gonna google, it. Google, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna google it yeah i'm gonna google it i'm gonna make it and this is how i learned a lot of things but also this could go this should go in pair with like staying humble that you might not know how to make it the best mm -hmm. there are people who are better than you there are better ways to do it and just always have this openness to not everything will be the best, but like being curious and wanting to make it work uh, is what pushes me forward. So mm -hmm. it would push me forward. But awesome. stay humble would be and stay curious. Awesome. That's I think that's a perfect way to end this. That's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs>